Support provided by Walters Papillon Thomas Cullins, LLC, specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years. Barbara, that's quite an introduction, and um, I, I was always hoping that that Bobby Flay thing would go away. <laughs> Once I was on CBS Sunday Morning with Wynton Marsalis, because that's the, you know, once upon a time it was the Bobby Flay butt kicking gumbo, but when Witten took a taste of it, he smiled and rolled his eyes and he said, oh, have mercy, Poppy. So I'd much rather be Witten Marcellus's have mercy, Poppy gumbo maker than anything to do with that old Bobby Flay. Um, thank you all so much for having me here today. I thought that perhaps it might be entertaining to tell you all some food stories about why Louisiana food is so distinctly better than all of the other foods. And I know that we're prejudiced about this living down here. I know we have our own opinion, but you know, it truly is. Our Louisiana cuisine is truly the first indigenous cuisine that was ever created in the United States. And of course, we were down here before anything else was happening, certainly in an eating way. Um, it's now 301 years since Bienville arrived on Mardi Gras Day. You know, you can't make that up. And toasted what uh, was about to become New Orleans. So that was 301 years ago. And so what happened then? There were so many fascinating things that we learned in New Orleans during our tricentennial. Can you imagine that once upon a time, where the French Quarter is today, it was, it was an Indian settlement. The Native Americans lived there. And those original settlers would have starved if it hadn't been for the Native Americans. Because um, in the same year that they first settled, um, there was a Pecote insurrection because there was nothing good to eat. And the few women who had made the trip had no idea what to do with these obscure and bizarre ingredients in the New World. And so Bienville's housekeeper, Madame Langlois, actually went and lived with the Native Americans for six weeks to figure out all their tricks and, and learn things about how to eat in this New World. They taught her many things. One of them was filet powder. So hang on to that filet powder. More on that in a minute. Why is the food the best here? You know, I think a lot of it has to do with the market system. And oh my goodness, I have to tell you all, your red stick market, don't tell the rest of South Louisiana, but I think it might be my very favorite market in the whole state. When you go to Red the Red Stick Market on a Saturday morning, it has a bustling energy that is hard to imagine. Well, how did that farmer's market thing get started? Well, again, we have to go back to New Orleans, where in 1718, there was a water market. A lot like in Southeast Asia, anybody who had anything to sell would pedal upriver or downriver and tie onto the banks right there, and sell to whoever came along. It was very impromptu in the laissez-faire way of the French people. Well, you know, then along comes the Spanish government. And the Spanish people are very different from the French. They love order. And so it was the Spanish who really brought order to the market. And uh, within 10 years had constructed the market that's down there today. But just like the red stick market bustling with vendors, I want you to imagine, let's forward to 1819. In 1819, at that original French market, on any given day, you would find 500 different vendors hawking their wares. Now, if you go to the, the grocery store hungry, and you're trying to figure out what you're going to cook for dinner that night, it's, it's distracting and difficult enough without having 
500 people trying to sell you. What they, can you imagine what an experience that would be like? If I could travel in time, that's one of my very favorite stops that I would make. So when we look at this overall picture, yes, we've got the French, yes, we've got the Spanish, but then, of course, the Africans, we mentioned the Native Americans, the English, the Germans, and the Italians. And of course, nowadays, because why is the culture, the food culture, so vibrant? Because we continue to absorb and enjoy just about anything that goes that, that comes down the pipe to us. Um, consequently, we can now add Vietnamese and the many, many Latino cultures from South America who have also settled here. And I really beg to differ with my friend Brett Anderson, who, God bless him, he must, I think it was a little sensational ism that we had to entitle that recent article in the New York Times, Is Gumbo Dead? Like, Brett lives in New Orleans. He might need to get a life. I just, I mean, he's dying out. How missing gumbo? I don't know how it would happen. That's Usually, I'm like Mrs. Microphone. So, okay, is that all right now? Brett lives in New Orleans, and you know he dines out for a living. I'm not quite sure how he's missing gumbo on all of the menus. And when it comes to gumbo, there's a couple of things I would like to talk to you about. You know. Here in South Louisiana, often we are referred to as a gumbo because we are. We're a big melting pot where we're assimilating all these things. Those original French settlers, some of the things they brought with them was the remoulade. It changed completely. We added Creole mustard to it and took the mayonnaise out. And so consequently, our remoulade is not even close to a kissing cousin of the one they're still serving in France. But that's the root of Louisiana food and why it's so fabulous, the innovation, the adapting to what is here. Now, really and truly, I'm going to give you all just a little room at lesson because I would say, let's just have a look. If you've ever made a roux, raise your hand. Okay. If you've ever been unhappy with your roux, raise your hand. <laughs> I think I can fix that for you right now without even doing a cooking demonstration. Okay, here's how it goes. You know, every single thing that we cook down here starts off, first you make a room, and then you add your seasonings. What are those seasonings? Celery, bell pepper, and onion. Yes, 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 that's referred to as the holy trinity of Creole cooking. However, I can tell you that my little French great-grandmother, who was very Catholic and alive till I was 10, would have washed my mouth out with soap if she had heard me calling the seasoning vegetables the holy trinity. You know, that is really a modern affectation that my memo would not agree with. But anyway, let's just get to the bottom line, and this is what it is. You're in the kitchen. You're stirring the oil, whichever one you choose to use. My favorite is bacon grease and the flour. About equal parts. And if you're nervous, add a little more oil. If you're feeling confident, you can add a little less. But you stir that root. Now, all those old recipes that got handed down, you know how they go. First you make a root, then you add your seasonings. That's really not the way to do it. First you make the root. And then if your grandmother never told you this, remember I did, put the onions in. The onions have to go in first and all by themselves. And why is that? Because onions have a great deal of natural sugars in them. And when the onions hit that hot roux, you get that roux cooked to about maybe a Hershey chocolate bar color, and then you dump those onions in, it stops the roux from burning, so it cools it down, and a magic trick happens. Those yellow Spanish onions, the mean ones that make you cry, have a lot of natural sugars in them. And the natural sugars in those onions exude into the dark roux, and the roux gets darker. It goes from milk chocolate, milk chocolate to bittersweet chocolate brown. And it's a beautiful thing. And then at that moment, it's okay to add the celery and the bell pepper. What would happen if you added all three of them at one time? The watery 
vegetable juices of the celery and the bell pepper without the concentration of the sugars will make the roux get lighter. And if you have stand, stood there and you have used your month's allotment of baking grease and you've been through the nerve-wracking experience that it is for some people to make a roux and it gets lighter, that is really going to bum you out. So please, for goodness sake, take my advice and if you're not making it like that, Try it, and you will thank me. So, the Spanish, you know, the Spanish come, and we have the Spanish to thank for all that beautiful iron lace work. Um, it was that fire of 1788 that had the big rebuilding effort happen, and that's when the French Quarter started to look Spanish. They also gave us things like perhaps jambalaya, even though a lot of people say that. I'm not positive. Leah Chase loves to talk about the paprika and where Creole food would be without the paprika. Leah said that Creoles really love the color red. And so one of her big secrets is a little sweet Hungarian paprika goes into almost everything that Leah cooks, particularly brown gravies. Try Leah's trick, just a little bit, maybe a quarter teaspoon, and you'll find that it brightens it up and adds just immeasurable things. And then, of course, there are the Africans who have contributed. They brought the rice. That's why so many of the enslaved people were brought to Louisiana was because of their rice growing knowledge. We didn't know how to do it here. And so the, they were brought from those specific regions in Africa to cultivate rice, sweet potatoes, peanuts, black-eyed peas, and then the big one, okra. Now, this is where we're going to go back to that filet powder topic because let's go back to that gumbo. And I love to talk with people about where did gumbo get its name? Well, if you talk to nine out of 10 people, they'll tell you, oh, it comes from the African word for okra because the African word for okra was kingombo. And my good friend Jessica Harris likes to spin a tale about how she imagines that original African woman in the French market stirring up a big pot of gumbo. And there's okra in it, and people aren't accustomed to seeing that okra. So they pass by and they say, what is that? And she says, kingombo. And somebody else comes, comes by and says, what is that? And she says, King Gumbo. Until about the third time, it's sort of like buy it or go. And she says, Gumbo, like go away. So she's a great scholar of African American food ways. And that's what she pretends is the way that our famous emblematic dish got its name. I missed the joke. <laughs> I know I didn't tell it. <laughs> However, one of my favorite things to tell people about is remember those Native Americans who were helping out uh, Madame Lanois and the rest of Bienville's female friends? Well, it turns out that from the dawn of time, the Choctaw Indians had been using filet powder for multiple uses. Uh, they used it as a flavoring agent because it does have a lovely sort of a herbal flavor. They used it for medicinal purposes because when you ingest a uh, filet, sometimes the human body will have a reaction to it and you'll break out in a sweat. That's why I make okra gumbo instead of filet gumbo because I figure here in South Louisiana it can be January and we can work up a good sweat without the help of the filet powder. But they used it to break fevers and for medicinal purposes. But the third thing is, of course, it was used as a thickener. Now, this is one of my favorite mental food puzzles. So here we have these two ingredients. Did you ever add two <coughs> filet powder to anything? It gets thready and stringy and very, very odd. Well, that is also the reason that a lot of people hate okra. Because if you don't cook the okra right, it gets thready and stringy, and it's what gives okra usually a bad name. So here we have 
two distinct ingredients. The Africans called okra combo. The, the Native Americans called filet powder king, oh, I, did it, I did it wrong, I'm sorry, forgive me. You know how this goes. The king gumbo is the Africans, and the filet powder is the combo. So you see where I'm going with this. Did gumbo get its name from the Native American combo or from the African king gumbo? This is something that I don't think we'll ever be able to figure the reason for or the true answer. But think about how amazing this is, that you've got two indigenous cultures living on two different continents who both have a very similar sounding ingredient that is treated in the same way. I just think that that is, it makes a big case for how perhaps all the continents were once joined and how maybe we all do share the same ancestors because that sure is a funny coincidence if you ask me. Now, the Germans came along too and I don't know if you all realize this but without our German settlers we would not be here today because we would have starved. We needed those hard-working Germans, the first of whom came as early as 1720. They settled on, on the coast, and that's where Des Almonds comes from, the German coast. And by 1724, they were supplying a substantial amount of the produce to the New Orleans market. By the end of the 19th century, over three million Germans passed through the port of New Orleans. And what did they bring? They brought with them their knowledge of preserving meat through smoking. And there are many, many people who would tell you that those French Cajuns would have starved if the Germans hadn't come along to help them. And a lot of people have great confusion over that Creole Cajun, which is which and where. Well, you know, here in Baton Rouge, you all sit the way I see it, right here in the cradle of Creole and Cajun. Baton Rouge is really sort of the place where you can claim both and they both come together. Because goodness knows all you have to do is cross the Mississippi River and you are venturing into Cajun country. One of my very favorite things about the Cajuns, the French Cajuns, the German Cajuns, is today they claim that the geographic line is I-10. And the great dividing element of their cuisine is the sausage. So if you live north of I-10, you are perhaps a prairie Cajun. And you might, your last name might be Schecksneider. If you live south of I-10, your sausage is what is called a green sausage. Not because it's green, but because it's fresh. It's not cured. It's not cooked and your last name might be Boudreaux. So these are really two different kinds of people, and I really think everybody needs to get their fair shake down here when it comes to what we show and the stories we tell to the rest of the world. The Italians, you know, I had the great fortune, let's see, I'm doing just fine. I had the great fortune of my last two books, um, were the Tujex Restaurant Cookbook, which came out about three years ago, and then most recently, the Pascal's Manali Cookbook. Well, I love both of these books. They're, they're like dear old friends to me, and I was honored to have the opportunity to write them both. You see, Tujex is the second oldest continuously operating restaurant in New Orleans, period, second to Antoine. 1856 is the year, and 1845 is Antoine's, 1856 is Tujac's. But Pascal's Manali is the second oldest continuously operating family-owned restaurant in New Orleans. Interestingly enough, both of them second to Antoine's, that they still have the same family operating it there, God bless the blunts, and uh, I'm so happy to say that at Manali's, there is a fifth generation 
who are a bunch of 30-somethings who are involved in the business, and I feel so good about what's coming next. But I had done that French Creole exploration, which is a story that perhaps everybody's a little bit more familiar with than that complicated Italian story, because the German story is simple compared to when we get to the Italian immigrants. I had no idea until I started doing the research that the first wave of immigrants from Italy came in the 1830s from the island of Eustica. And so the Eustatians, as they were referred to, these were an urban people. And so they came to New Orleans and the surrounding area. They became the wealthy importers and the restaurateurs. What was driving the commerce at this time? Citrus. Uh, those, there, there was actually a steamer. Imagine how fantastic this is. A steamer that would run from Palermo to the port of New Orleans. It took a little over two weeks to make the trip. The, the ship would come over filled with immigrants and lemons. You know, go back to those old drink books and you will find, even if it was a non-alcoholic drink, the first instruction for almost anything that they were going to assemble starts off with the juice of six or eight lemons. Lemons were so important, and it wasn't until the 20s that the citrus production came on in California and in Florida. Up until that time, those Italian, those Sicilian in particular, lemons were just prized. So, Amazing to me to find out that Emile Camardo actually changed his name and became Emile Commander. And that was who started Commander's Palace. He was an Italian man. I didn't know that was an Italian restaurant, did you? Um, it, it was such an amazing learning experience. And then, of course, the second wave comes from Sicily. The big importation of people who came between 1889 and 1910. I think that this is the reason that I've had such a great response to the Manali story. Because again and again, I talk to people who feel like I told their story in that Manali book. There's so many people in South Louisiana of Sicilian descent that it really becomes a little familiar to everyone. And the Sicilians, really, the time came when the French market should have been called the Italian market because it was the Sicilians who were growing everything and the Sicilians who were selling everything. Um, I am going to tell you one last little tale that is one of my favorites. And I always try, so if you've heard this tale before, forgive me, but this is a story that has really engaged me for a whole lifetime. I'm, I'm probably not doing so good. Let's see how it goes in this room. Okay, so raise your hand if you eat the beignet. Okay, now come on, who does not eat the beignet? All right, now, raise your hand if you have heard of or eaten the kala. Oh, see Poppy's not doing so good. You won't believe this. I have been on a mission for more than 25 years trying to save the kala. I'm, what is the kala? The kala is a rice cake. And it, to me, represents humanity and food all in one single story. You see, if we were to go to the open-air markets in Africa today, in Liberia and Ghana, you would find the women making kawa. If you walked up to them and said, what is that? In the Bantu tongue, they would answer, kawa. So this is a dish that made the trip across the Atlantic Ocean in the minds and hearts of the enslaved rice-growing peoples of Africa. And when it got to New Orleans, it became a very important part of the culture. Now, we are going back to the time before the Louisiana Purchase, when the city was ruled by the Code Noir. The Code Noir laid out the regulations for how 
The white people, the slaves, and the free people of color were to live together there in the city. And in the code, there were several things in the code noir that to me relate directly to the Kellogg story. One of them was, it said, all slaves were required by law to have one day a week off. The slave's day off was often Sundays. And what did they do on their days off? A lot of them went to the streets and became street vendors. Many, many of them were Kala vendors. This was so prevalent that they would go through the streets of New Orleans with their own special street call. They would call out, Kala, Kala, Belle Kala to show, Madame, Belle Kala to show, which means beautiful Kala is very hot. She was always waiting outside of St. Louis Cathedral. <laughs> she knew the moment that mass ended, those fasting Catholics would be a rapt audience for her hot rice Kala. <laughs> So that was thing one, okay, the slave's day off. Thing two in the Code Noir, it said, if a slave came to you and demanded his price and could pay it, then you were required by law to take his money and let him go. Now, I'm not saying that's what happened all the time. However, it was the law. And undoubtedly, it was the proceeds of the sale of the Kala, this indigenous dish that came in the hearts and minds of these enslaved people that later ended up buying freedom for them and their families. And I would say a dish that came from Africa and then ended up buying freedom for the enslaved people, I'd say that's a pretty important thing. And why in the world do we all know about the beignet and the kala has been forgotten? Well, that's because the beignet have always been sold from a stand at the French market. The Kala were a street vending tradition, and the street vendors disappeared around World War II, and they never came back. So the only way that you knew about the Kala at that point, from, from that point on, was if you had this as a tradition in your family. Oh, I didn't grow up with it as, as a tradition in my family. I didn't learn about it until I was in my early 20s and teaching cooking with Lee Barnes at her cooking school in New Orleans. And Leon Soniat, who was the great esteemed Creole cooking teacher, he taught Lee and I how to make the Kala. Well, a short while after I learned it, I was asked to have an event at the Audubon Zoo. They were opening up the swamp exhibit, so y'all have an idea how long I've been at this now. <laughs> and I had a little food booth at the zoo for a weekend, and I sold hot rice Kala, and of course, Cafe Olay. Well, this was my big life-changing food moment because my very first day there, one of my very first customers was an old gentleman. And he came up to the booth and he bought some kella. And he took a few steps away and took a bite and he came back to the booth. And the man had tears in his eyes. And he looked at me and he said, Lady, my mama used to make these for me all the time when I was a little boy. And I had forgotten all about this. Could you please tell me, how do you make these? Well, it was so clear that the taste of the Kala had brought this man's mother back alive to him. And it dawned on me so acutely that this is the thing that makes us all human. Exactly like what you all did today, coming together at the table. This is the place where we all come together because we, no matter who we are, religion is, what your race is, what your creed is, we all have to eat to live. And so I'm so glad that you all asked me here while you were having that very human experience of dining today. <coughs> and I do hope that you'll tune in and listen at 1 o'clock on Saturdays on WRKF or catch up on the eight years of programs that are, we were making podcasts before anybody knew what a podcast was. So we've got quite a collection of podcasts for your enjoyment. And if you want either my gumbo recipe, or if you would like my kala recipe, which I make two ways, so don't be confused. There's a sweet version, and about 10 years into my saving the kala effort, I started making it savory, so I could serve it more frequently. And actually, you will find that sometimes on the menu at Frank Brightston's restaurant in New Orleans. You'll find kala sometimes. 
Oh, at Commander's Palace and at Cochon, but they're usually savory when you see them on the menu now. And that only started about 10 years into my effort. I'll send you that recipe too. You can find me, I'm so easy to find, on poppy at poppytoker.com. And if you're interested in learning more about any of my books, my books are all there too, and I'm happy to personalize them. And I have to say, the WRKF has this wonderful retail sponsor, the Red Stick Market. And my new friend Anne over at the Red Stick Market has also offered to take orders if anybody would like something specially personalized. And I want to thank you all again for having me. And I hope to see you on the radio, if not in person, soon. Thank you. Support provided by Walters Papillon Thomas Cullens, LLC, specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years.